welcome to GM Tips, the show where my friends and I share with you our thoughts and suggestions on how to game master your role-playing game. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, co-creator of Maze Arcana and a guild adept for D&D. On today's show, we have Chris Lindsay from Wizards of the Coast. I got a chance to play in the epic game he wrote for GaryCon. There were 17 tables separated into three groups playing three parts of the battle. All of the GMs coordinated with each other through Chris, the event leader. Major moments are timed, and GMs are brought in to play the major villain NPCs. This was so much fun! I got to play a fairy blade singer named Mogwin Flashin. I went to each table three separate times during the last leg of the game, and they got to try to break the spell before I broke them. After playing, I figured out why people like these kind of games. The players suddenly became a part of something important to the world they exist in. So, today's theme is how to make your homebrew game feel epic. Tip number one, part of something bigger. In most games, you can look forward to fighting small groups with your players. If you want to make your encounter feel epic, have the group be part of an army or organization. They have people to report to and perhaps will be able to call for reinforcements. Suddenly, the group isn't alone in the world and has a reason to feel responsible for the outcome of the events. Tip number two, give them a choice. Prepare a few different choices for the players to pick from to be a part of the larger battle. In the epic I experienced, the tables chose whether to be a part of the infantry at the front line, in the air fighting the goblin airships, or underground fighting in the ritual chamber. Each of these choices are important to the story and will make the party feel like they're a major reason for the success of the overall battle. You can use how they succeed or fail to gauge how the rest of the battle unfolds. Failure doesn't mean death, it could just mean they didn't accomplish their goal on time. But all choices have consequences. There are always various levels of successes and failures. Play with these. Tip number three, time to pre-strategize tactics. In many encounters, most of our choices are reactionary to protect ourselves when something surprises us. Here, you can give your group time to talk about how they can work together during the anticipated battle, much like they would do in a war room. Let them ask the other NPCs about their tactics and use skills to find what their enemies or terrain is like, what advantages they can use, and other bits of information that will encourage them to think about ways around a situation. This is where I encourage them by granting triple advantage to two or more players that go at the same time and can explain clearly how their moves would work together. The GM has final say on whether that would work or not. You can give them this time for planning and remind them they have a much shorter time to make decisions during the actual encounter. Tip number four, encounter pacing. Timing is everything, and timing in battle is another way to make things feel epic. Keep your game moving fast. Your players can roll their attacks and damage at the same time, and they should have their choices ready to go. I like to do a three, two, one countdown for indecisive players. I could roll on, but instead, let's jump into conversation with the architect of DM's Guild, head of D&D Adventures League, and the product manager of Dungeons and Dragons, Chris Lindsay. Hey. hey! Thank you for coming, I'm so happy you're here. You're <laughs> one of my favorite people, and this is so great, and I wouldn't have all the things that I have if it wasn't for you. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled you're here. Um, you are amazing at creating epics. I love your writing. Your mm -hmm. adventures are so much fun. They're really wild. How how would you recommend for people to take that epicness and bring it to their table? So uh, the, the main thing about an epic adventure is that there's a lot more going on than just what's happening with the players themselves, right? There's a lot of motion. There's a lot of you know, moving parts and so forth. It's like the Battle of Helm's Deep. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's important to remember as the encounter progresses or as the adventure progresses to remind the PCs uh, that there are these other outside elements inside the scope of the adventure they're playing and that they come into play and that they interact directly with the characters so that when they have those moments uh, in the game where they might stumble, something might be there to like pick them up. Pick them up? Yeah, give them hope, uh, help them out, uh, remind them that, that they're part of a larger squad or larger unit or larger organization, something that, that basically puts them uh, in perspective, that they're just a very small part of a larger, larger world. 
Yeah, it's really interesting because you don't think about that when you're writing adventures, usually in one shots or even like small campaigns. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, you're going in, you're going to go and fight a thing. But taking that microcosm, that little, that little thing that you do, and then having that affect, uh, you know, like uh, another group, which affects another group, which affects another group. Mm -hmm. uh, what made you start developing epics? Really, uh, it all comes down to movies, right? You, you see like these big, big scope movies, like all the way back to like Ben-Hur, we had these massive battles and, and you, the heroes are doing something and, and then something huge and unstoppable gets in their way. But from the outside, you got have somebody who jumps in and does something to help them out and all of a sudden you're past it and you move on and you keep on going after your, you know, whatever it is your objective is, right? Uh, but the point is, is that you have that feeling of scope and scale of being a part of something so grand and, and that you know you can't conquer it by yourself, but if you could just do your one little thing that you need to do, that everything will be okay. That's awesome. So you have your group and they are connected with other groups yes. in the big battle. Yeah. How do you get them to actually remember that they're a part of something bigger? Well, for example, um, if you are playing in the adventure that we ran at GaryCon, uh, as they're moving along, the players might come up against like a horde of demons heading their direction, and they're thinking, "Oh no, this is it. We're done. We're we're, we're all dead. This we can't we can't possibly manage to deal with these demons, right?" But then all of a sudden, like from out of nowhere, a massive wall of thorns comes up as the druid, who's like a hundred yards behind them cast this epic spell and like stops the demons off just enough so that the players have to deal with just these three demons and then they can continue moving, right? Yeah. And then they reminded, oh yeah, there's this guy back there, he's there to help us. And they know that they're a part of this much bigger force and that the other people are actually looking out for them at the same time. That's that they're really doing cool. Their thing. Yeah, I mean, if I were going to do an epic, I might have the players, the way they interact with the NPCs mm -hmm. would be how much they help them. Oh yeah, <laughs> Cause absolutely. Because they're jerks oh, to, yeah. the, to the NPCs. It's like, well, I have these reinforcements, but you're not very nice, so we're gonna focus our energies over here. And in a home game, that's totally possible. <laughs> in a home game, I mean, even in not in a home game, that's totally possible, but it's more likely to happen in a home game where the dungeon master can really focus on how the players have interacted in the past with other characters, um, and I would, be a liar if I didn't say that a couple of parties haven't died at my hands because they made poor choices in the past. And an NPC said, and this is the point where I save you, but time to take a water break. <laughs> <laughs> um, other ways would be mm, maybe like a scrying stone to see how the other, like, the other side of the battle. Absolutely, going. sending stones are also very valuable, as you have like your own mini one-shot walkie-talkies. Medieval cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty yeah. cool. That's where things like animal messenger also come into play, right? You're there. You cast your animal messenger spell, and then like five rounds later, somebody does something to help you out because they got the message. Yeah. So you've got your group, and they are they're fighting and they're fighting and people are going down and people are going down. As a game master, do you, are you the one that says, okay, there's too many people going down right now, I have mm -hmm. to send in somebody to save them? I don't necessarily think of it as saving them. I think of it as uh, using those elements that are already present in the game. Nobody wants to feel like, oh, there's no way I could have possibly done this without, you know, this other NPC's help. The players still want to be, even in an epic battle, the players still want to be the focus. They want to be the heroes of the day. So it's, again, this is important to remember which NPCs and which other characters outside of themselves that they've interacted with and the ones that they've had positive interactions with, right, are the ones that are going to help them. Then you can point back to, this person came out to help you, but they would not have done that if you wouldn't have been such a cool person and helped them out previously. It's important to set up those milestones ahead of time before you get to the epic like encounter itself. So the angel swooping in, you know, guardian Deva swooping in to like cast healing over like the entire party, just not enough to bring them all the way up, but enough to like give them two seconds of hope that they can continue moving on. So mechanically, if you're designing a game and you want to make the players 
feel like the one thing that they're doing is the most important. Mm -hmm. um, in the epic, there were three different paths that they could take. Yeah. How do you make each one of those paths feel like this is, this is the moment that you are saving the day? You have to be really clear that if they don't succeed, that there are consequences, and you have to make sure that they understand what those consequences are ahead of time. You, I mean, epic scale battles don't just happen out of the blue, right? Uh, they didn't just go attack the Death Star out of, you know, nothing, right? They all knew what they were doing. They all had a plan, and they all knew what the consequences were if their part didn't work. So when, they're ha when they have that war table, they have that war time, but before they go into this big epic thing, you have to have their, your NPC generals or whoever it is that's in charge from their perspective explaining very carefully to the player characters what happens if they screw up and what happens if they don't do their part. And it's going to be different for each table, for each group, if, whether you're in the air or whether you're on the land or whether you're underground. The consequences will affect what happens to the other groups dramatically. So you've got your group, you're in this battle, and you've designed the adventure to feel really epic. Mm -hmm. How do you use the environment in each encounter? The environment is actually really, really important uh, because it's, in an epic encounter, everything happens on a grand scale. So in, you know, in your underground epic encounter, as an example, you would be going through the tunnels and you're in tight spaces and then all of a sudden the tunnels will open up into this massive cavern that's like thousands of yards around and you get this feeling that you have to possibly be deep, deep, deep underground because nothing else would support this and there's stalagmites, stalagmites and there's a huge lake and there's like several like dotted islands through the lake as you're looking out across the thing and then there's a buzzing sound and you see the canoes and you have to get in the canoes, but the whole thing feels so massive. And as you're rolling across the lake in the canoes, you can see water churning in various places in the distance as things are starting to move and uh, react to your presence. And, and really the scope of the environment is, is vastly important. If you're outside, like letting them know that weather exists is, is wildly important in weather in epic encounters is never fun. <laughs> it's never a sunny, bright day. You gotta pour down rain and snow and hail. They have to run across lakes of ice. They have to worry about things breaking underneath them. They're crawling across like chasms and there's big rope bridges that are gonna break at any second and there's all these things swarming around them. You just have to like, it's never gonna be, it can never be fun. So that's interesting because usually, uh, not usually nowadays people are so into minis and so mm -hmm. i feel like the minis actually keep the battles very small because you only have a certain amount of space to move your figures in exactly but keeping it theater of the mind gives it that grander scale exactly because if you get into your descriptions and by the way for dungeon masters out there it's important that you, you write up maybe a handful of descriptions ahead of time so you know kind of where the direction you're going. And it's perfectly okay to ad-lib off of those descriptions and go off script and so forth, but just to have something kind of to base yourself off of is really kind of key, just so you, you know, have that something to anchor you. But, but theater, theater of the mind is perfectly the best way to go in this case because nothing evokes the feelings that you're gonna have as a player or as a dungeon master, like what's in your head. Putting everything out onto a battle mat totally puts it into a confining space that has limitations. And in Epic, there is no limitations. So if you're in battle and you're fighting in, in that immediate moment, then the minis make sense. But if yes. you're going to the destination yeah. or uh, just, just in the descriptions, it's better to have everyone be present mm -hmm. and listening yep, and paying attention. Absolutely. Paying attention is very important. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and trust is also very important. This, this, this idea of I'm going to give you all the information that you have at your disposal at any given moment. I'm not leaving stuff out, really. I'm not necessarily always trying to kill you. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm going to ask you three questions. Sure. Are you ready? I'm totally ready. I have to read this one because I can never remember it. Okay. What does your pre-game house rule look like? I don't really have a pre-game house rule list. Um, it's more like abandon hope all ye who enter here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
That's good. It's okay not to have one. I Absolutely. ask because a lot of people do, yeah. but um, it's. I feel it's really good to know that not everybody does. Nope. Second question. What is your favorite GM moment? My favorite GM moment actually happened very recently, um, and it was at the Stream of Annihilation when we were playing, and we're playing in the Grung game. And it, I had prepared all of the Grung characters ahead of time, and I had prepared the adventure, but I knew that, or I hoped, I should say, that it would kind of take on a life of its own. And I handed the player characters out to everybody ahead of time and gave them an opportunity to read them and so they could get their own feel for what it is that they were going to do. And it happened. It was so <laughs> magical as we kind of sat there. And I think I almost did nothing during that game except for sit back and watch the sitcom like pretty much <laughs> unfold before me as all the grung in that party started to interact with each other. And it was, and every once in a while I would jump in and it was kind of like being in a band and having that ultimate jam session yeah right as everybody just kind of jammed off each other that was really fun thank you yeah. and it's funny because that was rudy's favorite gm moment mm -hmm. yeah last question oh yeah quick tip for the audience uh my my first and best and only tip to the audience is remember if you're a player out there that it's just as important that you are focused on the fun of the entire group as a dungeon master is. It's not just about you, the individual player. You want to make it fun for everybody at the table. That's how you get invited back. Mic drop. Yes. <laughs> That's our show for today. Chris, thank you so much for coming all the way to Burbank from Seattle just to be on our show. Mm -hmm. uh, please tell us where we can find you on the internet and if there are any fun little things that you can share. Absolutely. You can find me on the internet on Twitter uh, my Twitter handle is at Onatrix, O-N-N-A-T-R-Y-X. Um, and otherwise, you can find me, if you look very closely, hunting through the jungles of Chultz, looking for all the undead in the Tomb of Annihilation. Dun, dun, dun! Is there any, any little secrets you have? Any spoilers? Any, is there anything new coming out that we can share? Anything new coming yeah. out? Uh, maybe. There's Xanathar's. And Xanathar's has all the character options that you're going to want to play. That is awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. New builds for everybody. Oh my gosh. Thank you for watching. As always, I'm Satin Phoenix at Satin Phoenix. You can ask me GM tip questions at hashtag Ask Satin and find me every Sunday at noon on Maze Arcana's Orphan Echo on twitch.tv slash Maze Arcana and every Tuesday night Dungeon Mastering on twitch.tv slash D&D. Thank you for watching us here on Geek and Sundry and see you next time. Chris, there's one more thing for you to do. Oh, yes? Would you please GM us out of here? Absolutely. You emerge from the jungle into a vast marshland, and in the marsh you stand amidst the ruins and wreckage of armies come past, and a mist, a mist drifts over the entire land, and through the mist you spy a vast army of undead, one so insurmountable you can't possibly imagine defeating it. But behind you, you hear the armorific squeal of a million giant miniature space hamsters <laughs> led by Boo as they charge out of the jungle to your assistance. Yay! Squee! <laughs>